Welcome back to the Swamp 24-7 Podcast. I'm Thomas Goldcamp here with my co-host Blake Alderman. Blake, uh, we talked a little bit of recruiting on the last episode of the podcast. I uh, thought maybe we'd shoot on Tuesday, come back with an episode after hearing from Dan Mullen, but uh, I guess I was a little bit optimistic in expecting to hear anything out of Florida that might be uh, revealing, interesting, worth talking about on the podcast. So we pushed it off and we held till Thursday. But Blake, we have had some recruiting news since our last podcast. I know uh, I spent some time asking you kind of, you know, what Florida would have to do to kind of get things going, get things cooking down the stretch here in this 2022 cycle. Unfortunately, Blake, the news that we got in between last episode and this one, maybe not so positive for Florida. Yeah, you know, it's never good. You know, the week before, um, Florida lost a commitment from linebacker Shamar James, who was one of Florida's highest rated commits. Um, and then turn around a week later and you have another guy in uh, Julian Humphrey, a four star cornerback from the state of Texas. Another top 100 commitment for Florida backed off that verbal pledge on Monday night. Um, you know, while it is a sting, you know, there is some sting effect because obviously, you know, Florida's left with one top 100 commitment left in their 2022 class. You know, it's never a good thing to lose good commitments like Julian Humphreys and Shamar James. But I think a lot of people had seen the writing on the wall with Humphrey. As far as him looking around at schools, I mean, this is a guy who committed to Florida in the spring, uh, took that official visit um, in June, but also continued to visit a lot of schools. You know, a lot of schools popped up on the radar. He went on a big visit tour and you can make some sense of that, you know, coming off of June, you know, you guy that, you know, had to deal with a, you know, a, a over a year long recruiting dead period, you know, maybe didn't get to see all the schools he wanted to. So I, you could make some sense of that, but, you know, continue to take visits even after the summer, you know, going to Georgia, going to Texas A&M, those were the two schools that really emerged to see kind of the threats to the schools that he continued to visit. And don't get me wrong. He continued to visit Florida. He was there for Friday night lights. He came for the Alabama game. But he just never really shut things down. You know, he was always, you know, visiting Texas A&M in Georgia. He took that official visit to Georgia um, in uh, in October. He was there uh, on October 1st uh, that weekend. And it seems like right now, you know, with him backing off things, I think Texas A&M and Georgia are the two schools to watch. If I had to pick one of those two, I would say more than likely watch Georgia there. Um, I think it seems at least that Texas A&M. Um, it's kind of having him in a little bit of a holding pattern, you know, kind of letting things play out with some other guys on the board. So um, it looks like Georgia is the team to watch for Humphrey. And again, big loss for Florida. You know, it's, it's all about, I think, the perception even when, you know, a guy that's, you know, leaning towards Georgia being seen leaning towards Georgia and he decommits the week of Florida, Georgia. So, um, you know, it's definitely some sting effect there. But again, I think this is one that, you know, I think a lot of Florida fans have been kind of waiting for this one to happen. Yeah. I and mean, I guess that's kind of where I struggle a little bit. You know, I, you don't want to focus too much on on any one single recruit because I mean these are you know these are guys that are 17 18 year old guys you know they're making their decisions there's a lot coming at them but I think the I guess the more concerning thing is this seems to be somewhat of a trend for Florida and I guess you know we've talked about it you know where Florida's at in year four under Dan Mullen the way things get fixed is by recruiting elite talent right and Dan Mullen can coach his way I, I don't think again that Florida needs to be you know, recruiting all the way up at Alabama or Georgia's level. But the problem is when you're going against the talent gap against those programs, you're going to play them at least Georgia every year, LSU, same thing. You know, these are some of the recruits that you have to eventually keep home. Yeah. Or not keep home, but keep in your class, you know, kind of, kind of, you got to win some of these battles. So was there anything that Florida could have done differently with Julian Humphrey maybe, or is this, you know, like you said, kind of just writing on the wall, maybe Florida should have pivoted elsewhere quicker. Like what's, what's kind of the solution here? Because this is two high profile guys now from Florida's class. It seems like right or wrong. The narrative is that, you know, not only is recruiting not necessarily going to be the answer, but it's actually kind of trending the same way as the on the field results right now, which is not in a favorable direction for Florida. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, you know, I think Florida had been starting to pivot on a guy like Shamar James, um, you know, the linebacker that we mentioned earlier decommitted. Um, I think you saw Florida start to turn things up on a four star linebacker from down in Miami, Wesley Basanti. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they really started to put some more attention there. So I think that they had kind of started to realize, you know, when Shamar pops up on visits to Georgia that, you know, it's time to start. Obviously, Florida would have taken Wesley and Shamar and, and uh, you know, EJ Lightsey, and that would have been their class. You know, they would have taken all those guys. But I think that you saw them start to put a little bit more effort in a guy like Wesley whenever, you know, it started to seem like Shamar was looking around, hadn't been to campus since July. You know, so that, that long period of time, but he was able to pop up on Georgia's campus, or at least there were rumors of him popping up there for the Arkansas game. I know he told the Florida staff that he wasn't there. 
could have been a secret visit. Who knows? You know, but he, he definitely was there. He was definitely there for the uh, Georgia Kentucky game, um, planning to go back there for the Missouri game when they play Missouri for an official visit. So I think that's where you see Florida start to look at, you know, a guy like Wesley turning the heat up on him some more, brought him in on an official visit. Um, he'll make his decision sometime closer. To, I believe it's the weekend of Thanksgiving that he's ideally wanting to do that. Um, but as far as, as Julian, it's interesting because the defensive backboard is starting to look a little bit like a question mark. Mm-hmm. You know, Florida's offered some new guys. Um, you know, they've got Jamarian Burt in the class they see as a DB. Um, you know, they're still recruiting guys, you know, committed guys like Chris Graves, who's committed to Miami, a four-star guy down there in, a, in Fort Myers area. You know, they offered a Penn State commit, Cam Miller, who's up in the Ferdinand Beach area. Um, so, you know, they're, they're starting to expand the board there. They're even recruiting a guy, Emory Floyd, um, out of the state of Georgia, who's committed to South Carolina. He seems very receptive to Florida's going to take some visits. So it's it's a position where, you know, Nazari A. Thomas, who's a guy that Florida had been in a great spot with for most of the fall, you know, now he's starting to trend towards Oklahoma. So I think you're starting to see some of those names on the defense a backboard, you know, either trend away to other schools or they're going to have to kick the tires on some guys that are committed. So, you know, if you can't really get any play from some of those guys that are committed to other schools or you can't swing things back in your favor for a guy like Azari A. Thomas, you know, the, I think that's a position where you might need to see Florida start to expand the board with some new offers if you can't get any traction with those committed guys. Like, what, what is Georgia doing that Florida's not? I mean, maybe that's a very obvious answer because, you know, Kirby Smart, widely regarded as a very good recruiter. But what are they telling these guys that they're getting them on board where Florida maybe even had them at one point in the class and then all of a sudden not able to kind of finish it out? Well, you know, I think this year, you obviously you have, you know, number one ranking, you have the undefeated season, you know, you have a strong defense for some of these defensive guys like Shamar James and Julian Humphreys. I mean, Florida's D de- or excuse me, Georgia's defense is playing great. So I think you have that first and foremost for some of these guys this cycle. But again, you know, I mean, what's what's uh, Mullen again, one, one to three, right? one and three against Kirby smart so yeah. far in his tenure there. I mean, yeah. you can pull that in your back pocket for guys that are, you know, well, maybe have four in the mix or he's only played three times, but okay. Yeah, so we'll sorry. Talk about one, one and two, one and two, yeah. sorry. Um, one and two, um, you know, through his career, you know, Kirby can have that feather in his hat that, you know, man, Dan Mullen hasn't been able to beat me consistently. And I know that was something that he was pitching to guys before last year where Florida won. Obviously Florida turned the tide there and was able to pull out a win in Jacksonville. And that gave them, you know, some, some mojo on the recruiting trail. Some of these guys, you know, kind of getting over the hump, building things up there. But I think in general, just Georgia staff, as a whole, it's just more aggressive with recruits. Yeah. You know, I think that they put a lot more effort into it. You look at the spending that Georgia puts towards recruiting. You know, I think a lot of those things, you know, matter. And I just think it's just, you know, kind of a trickle down effect from a guy like Kirby Smart, who learned how to recruit from Nick Saban, you know, who learned that, you know, you need to recruit those big time players to build your roster up, you know, from uh, from your starting 11 all the way down to, you know, depth and having, you know, solid depth. I mean, you know, look at Alabama, you know, a five star guy goes out, you know, with an injury, you put in a high four star top right. 100 type of guy or a five star type of guy. So I think that the trickle down effect of Kirby Smart being a good recruiter himself has trickled down to his staff who's got recruiters and coaches. So I just think it's just the more aggression they put into it. I think they put more emphasis on it. You see them, you know, really going out and, you know, just being a lot more um, aggressive in guys' faces, you know, showing, you know, pitching all sorts of things like, you know, look at the guys we've had drafted, look at the guys that, you know, are playing really high level. So I think in general, it's just, um, I just think when you look at, you know, Kirby Smart to Dan Mullen, I think you look at Kirby Smart and he's more, he, he puts more focus on recruiting than, you know, I think Dan Mullen does. Yeah, I think that's that's got to be a huge part of it. And, you know, we talked about leading into the Florida-Georgia game last year, how difficult it was going to be for Florida to start really kind of turning the tide in some of those recruiting battles if they couldn't, you know, prove that they can beat Kirby Smart on the field. And that was, I think, you know, in the outside, outside of, you know, UF and UGA fan circles, that was also kind of, you know, an understanding that Florida had to show something on the field you know, at some point getting into year three with Dan Mullen so that they could start to recruit better. And I think the disappointing part is you, you had that last year, you know, Florida wins 44 to 28. And yeah, sure. You caught some, some really favorable circumstances. I mean, Georgia had quarterback issues for that game. Florida had a veteran in Kyle Trask, you know, so with the COVID off season, Florida was better positioned, all that kind of thing. But I mean, you, you talk about the amount of talent that Georgia has on that defense. And I, I think that's the the clearest example of what winning more of these recruiting battles than you lose ends up with, right? I mean, Florida's got some NFL players on defense, and they've even beaten Georgia for some of those NFL players. I mean, Florida beat out Georgia for Kyrie Elam, but that's only one right. guy. And and I think the issue is we haven't right. seen that happen 
maybe consistently. Because you haven't seen it haven't happen yet exactly consistent consistently enough. Yeah, and so I, I think you know Marcus Dan Mullen, Burke is another guy on offense. I mean, they've won some battles against Georgia. It's just not a consistent enough basis, and and probably not enough for those those truly upper tier guys. I mean, Kyrie Elam's exactly the kind of guy we're talking about. You know, Julian Humphrey, Shamar James. These are the kind of guys that if you stack enough of them. Dan Mullen's going to win games. And and I know I know there's a, a popular kind of talk in the fan base right now that maybe Dan Mullen's even overhyped as a as a coach. But like I I don't believe that at all. I think I think Dan Mullen what he's able to do offensively, like we can we can be frustrated with Florida's results from the end of 2020 to now, but at the end of the day when Dan Mullen does kind of get in his bag so to speak as a play caller when he's got a game plan that works. I mean, it's incredible. And he can he can take you to places that you haven't been offensively when you look at what he did with Dak Prescott at Mississippi State. Now, the question mark is, can you do that across the entire program? And I I think, obviously, you know, defensive coordinator, we've all talked about that. That's a big issue. But to me, recruiting is kind of the great equalizer. And when you have somebody in your division that you play every year that is recruiting head and shoulders better than you, that's why Florida's in the position it is right now. That's why fans are a little bit frustrated and you know, Blake, I mean, even one of the guys that just committed, I believe, today was a guy that we talked about on the podcast, Jacavian Nonar, an offensive lineman that a lot of people thought, ranking-wise, maybe shouldn't even be on Florida's board. Well, he picks Maryland. It just continues this kind of uh, unsettling direction, trend, whatever it is, that, you know, it seems like, it's it, it, to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, to me, it almost seems like Florida has like two seasons, right? They have the football season where things are going well on the field, the coaches are really focused on that, and then it's a separate recruiting season. Like, Florida staff tends to close pretty well. You can point to Josh Braun, you know, some of these other battles that they've won late, but it's almost like they're two separate calendars for Florida. And I think when you look at, you know, what Kirby Smart does, showing up in helicopters to to high school games and stuff like that, they live, eat, and breathe recruiting. And I think that's maybe what you're saying about Dan Mullen is it from the top down, it just doesn't come across that way. And I think... I mean, I think, honestly, you're seeing the results of that in Florida's class. Uh, Blake, real quick before we close close the door on recruiting and, and pivot to this Florida-Georgia game, what does Florida have to do? I mean, is, it, is there any way this class gets salvaged at this point? I mean, give it to us point blank. You know, I think there's a way to salvage it. I don't think it's going to be up to, you know, the par of what fans want. You know, I think Florida usually finishes just outside of that top 10. I think it'll be a little bit lower this year. I'm thinking maybe top 15 ish somewhere around there. Um, you know, they've still got some guys on the board, you know, there, there's still plenty of four-star guys out there, but it's just closing. They need to close out on some of those guys. They need to win those recruiting battles. If not that, that class, you know, continues to drop down even lower, you know, so do I think they can write the ship? Yeah, I think they can. I think they could put more effort into it. You know, obviously this year, Dan Mullen is dealing with, you know, his show cause penalty with the, that goes from this right. evaluation period, which we are in right now and will end later this year. I believe it's the end of November. And that goes into December where you start having First couple days of December. things like yeah. that. So, you know, those are going to be open for him to be able to do those things. But, you know, you're not having the wow effect of, you know, Dan Mullen has done the helicopter ride before, you know, he's done that before where he's landed on, you know, on guys campuses, but it, he can't do that this year. So I think once you get that out of the way, you know, and I don't even know that it's really a big deal having a head coach, you know, come to your games and things like that, because you can't talk to the guys. Maybe it's just the presence is there and it shows mm-hmm. the effort, you know, those things are definitely a positive, but it's not like Dan Mullen can go out there and go see, you know, a Julian Humphrey, you know, let's throw out the show cause and, yeah, you know, just say sure. that that wasn't in there. He couldn't go out there and have a big, you know, conversation with him there, but you could see he was there. So, I mean, yeah, that's there, but, um, you know, just focusing more, you know, ha- you know, holding the staff accountable, you know, John Hevesy hasn't really been known as an elite recruiter over the, you know, the course of the period of his time being, you know, just a, a college coach. He's been mm-hmm. known as a developer type of guy, um, you know, getting some of those guys, um, you know, on the offensive line, you know, get better, you know, just, and I think it, it's, the offensive line, I think, is a position where they need to, you know, recruit better. Obviously, running back is another position that, you know, they've had to go through the portal for some of those guys. They've had some success through there. But, you know, even before this year, you know, every time I posted a story about Greg Knox on the board, you know, there were pictures of him, you know, being put on there because he hadn't landed a high school running back. Right. Um, I believe Naquan Wright and, uh, you know, Terrence Gibbs, who he has now, are the only two that he's landed from high school. So I think holding those guys more accountable, you know, getting them to be more aggressive, you know, it's not a lot of times that I've had guys, you know, when I say, you know, what schools are recruiting you hardest that Florida is one of those, you know, yes, there are some of those guys that do mention Florida as being one of the schools to recruit them harder, but it's not again on a consistent basis. So I think consistency, you know, putting more effort into it, 
Um, you know, really going and, you know, the recruiting staff, getting those guys in touch with some of those guys to kind of help the staff, you know, because when you're in season, you really need to lean on some of those guys to, you know, get in touch with recruits, you know, while you're planning a game plan or you're having practice. So, you know, I think overall it's just consistency and effort, you know, and I think that effort comes from the top down. And I think Dan Mullen, who hasn't really been known as an aggressive recruiter over the time of him being a coach, I think it's time for him to take a look in the mirror and say that, you know, look, you know, I can't develop all these guys, you know, do you want a Florida team that, you know, yeah. is good every couple of years, whenever those guys you develop developed or getting to a point to where they can compete for those games, but you have down years in between there while you continue to develop those guys. No, you need to really kind of change your, you know, your outlook on things and recruit those really good players, you know, get those guys in there. You know, I, I get that, you know, not every coach bases things off the star system, but you know, a lot of those high four star, five star players that, you know, the Alabamas and the Georgias are, be, you know, landing. I mean, they end up being really good. They're players, ranked that so. way for a reason. Well. Exactly. So I think putting more, putting more emphasis on that, you know, from the top down. And I think that'll have a trickle down effect. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at this point, you know, I, I think through the first two years of Dan Mullen's tenure, you could kind of make the case. I mean, you could see it, you know, with the results that they had turning around from a four win team to a 10 win team, then 11 wins. Uh, really, even last year playing Alabama toe to toe. I mean, I, I think the the issue that you're seeing now is to consistently have success in the SEC. Talent needs to be on par. Like you said, you can't just be hoping at a place like Florida that your roster kind of all the gears click and align at the same time in terms of seniority guys that have been developed having a quarterback that really can can do it all like those things you can't you can't rely on all those things coming together in just the right year because right. that's only going to happen is a coach that does less with more and that's florida's not a place that you should have to do that well i mean that's to me that's okay yeah, but, it is, but you need but you, to. You've got so much talent around you in your backyard that that's just not a school that's it's necessary to do that. And it's right. great that he can do that, right? But it's and just you, not you just need to bring the less further along. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, like if the less was a little bit more, <laughs> for lack of a better phrase, then all of a sudden, you know, you're talking about, yeah, maybe the ball bounces your way the wrong way this year, but the following year it doesn't, and then all of a sudden you're a championship contender. Like it's not to me, it's not. They're not that far off. Like I know that Florida is two and six against their last, you know, their last eight Power Five opponents. Yeah, I know all the numbers and all that. You know, Florida hasn't done well in one score games the last, you know, six seven outings. It it, it is what it is. But if you if your talent was a little bit better, if your margin for error was a little bit bigger. All of a sudden, you know, a, a game changing potential quarterback like Anthony Richardson is kind of the final piece rather than right now. What it seems like with Anthony Richardson is he has to be a Heisman caliber superstar for Florida to win a national championship. Like to me, I don't see enough pieces around him right now or enough continued development, enough you know steady development of the positions around him for Florida to be in a place where there you can expect to compete for championships, even with a game breaking QB. And to me, that's a problem. But Blake, let's take a quick break. I want to talk about Florida, Georgia. I mean, we'll preview it some, but I think at the end of the day, we're looking kind of at a similar scenario as last year, you know, and, and maybe even a little bit dire because we're one year further down the road now in Dan Mullen's tenure, where you got to at least show something. I'm not saying you have to beat Georgia, but you've got to show something that says, Hey, don't write us off yet. Don't look at this, you know, could be two and seven in our last nine power five games. Like you're getting pretty close to the point of no return. And I think this Georgia game, you know, even if you don't come out with a W, it's a big game for Florida. So let's take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back on the other side, breaking down the Florida Georgia game. Welcome back to the Swamp 24-7 Podcast. I'm Thomas Goldcamp here with my co-host Blake Alderman. Blake, let's let's get into some game preview here. Uh, Florida set to take on Georgia and Jacksonville, two touchdown underdog. I don't think a lot of people expect Florida to be competitive in this game, but it does look like Anthony Richardson's healthy. We saw a shift to Anthony Richardson in the second half of that LSU game. Now, as you and I both know, Dan Mullen's going to keep it close to the vest in terms of what he's going to do at quarterback. Georgia's, they will have a quarterback out there. Yeah, they're going to play one. So we know that. Uh, but, you know, George is going to do the same thing. We, you know, I, at the end of the day, for me, Anthony Richardson's got to play a bulk of the game for Florida to have a shot. And that's as simple as he's more unpredictable at this point. You have less tape on him. And I think he's more explosive than Emory Jones. And not that Florida won't necessarily need Emory Jones in this game, but I think you're very much at risk of things unraveling on you quickly in this game. And there's a couple reasons I say that. I think defensively, because of the decision to retain Todd Grantham last year, you were going to be in a place where if the defense struggled again this year, players are going to know 
you know, the, the kind of pressure that's on Todd Grantham. And, like, one of the concerning things I heard from Florida players from that LSU game to now is you're starting to hear very subtle breaks in the rank in terms of what they say publicly, you know, kind of keeping the, the, the company line, the, the toe in the company line, keeping that team first approach. And what I mean by that is when, you know, Mahmoud Diabate is asked after the LSU game, you know, what's your confidence in the scheme? And he says, well, I'm confident my teammates are going to play hard. That's not exactly a, a, a ringing endorsement for your defensive coordinator. And I love when players are honest. So, so don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, Diabate should face any kind of heat or anything. I think he's being honest with you. And what you're seeing there is some frustration. We heard it again this week. Daquan Newkirk, he said, well, I think LSU just kind of out-schemed us a little bit. To me, Blake, those comments are a little bit concerning because not that they're not true. I think they are true. I and mean, I think anybody watching knows they're true. The problem is if things go wrong in games going forward and you have players willing to say those things publicly, at what point do they just kind of throw their hands up and say, hey, man, we're doing everything we can do. We've, we've subtly expressed frustration. If they're saying that publicly, I'm sure within the building, they're having conversations about, hey, man, what we're doing is not working, like that kind of thing. So I guess my concern, Blake, is this this Florida Georgia game. We know the first quarter can be interesting, and we've seen games get out of hand early in the first quarter in this Florida Georgia game over the years. If Florida doesn't come out strong, Blake, I mean, I I don't know, man. I, I this team feels like it could quit to me. You know, and I'd agree. I think whenever you start to get to the point where you know Florida's already out of contention, you know they're fighting. I think at this point, you know, I, I do think there's some merit when coaches say that, you know, a rivalry game like this, Florida players are going to want to get up and play hard. And, you know, if it's A, winning a rivalry game in general, B, turning things around to finish out the season strong, or C, just going out and just giving Georgia an L and, you know, ruining their perfect season, ruining their, you know, their hopes of, you know, and dreams of things. You know, I, I don't, I, those kind of things, obviously heading into the game, you can use to motivate your team, but if they get down early, like you said, we've seen some of these early games, you know, early part of the game where Florida gets down and they have to claw their way back or they try to fight their way back. And, you know, maybe don't, um, you know, I don't think this is a year to where Florida can do that just because it's, it's different than others because you've seen Florida and Georgia come in, you know, highly ranked big time at, you know, SEC showdown and you know, this, this game is going to, you know, decide the East, you know, the path to who goes to Atlanta. And it's, that's, that's not the case this year. So I think that you could see some of those guys who already know that they're probably playing for like a you know what like a you know a tax slayer bowl or yeah. you know a you know citrus bowl so, something Blum they're some playing for they onions. <laughs> right you know they don't want to play in those kind of games you know they want to go in there and play those new year six games national championship type games playoff games and such so i think that i agree that that's a, a game that if the things get ugly early i don't think you'll see a florida team like last year to where they got down early but they came back and they fought hard and they played really great you know they had all those things in the line and i just don't think you have you see that same motivation this year yeah, I uh, let's let's talk some keys to the game. I think my number one key is Florida has to win the turnover battle by at least two. I mean, I don't see any way that Florida wins this game if they're even in the turnover battle, turnover turnover battle, or if I mean, I, I just don't see it. I don't see it. You've got to create more chances, more drives against Georgia. I think Anthony Richardson's explosive. I think that can keep you. That to me, when you talk about you know not not wanting the team to quit on you. I think playing Anthony Richardson is a big part of that because he can make things happen in an instant. So even if you get down 10, 14, if he's playing, you still feel like you have a shot. Now, once it snowballs past 10, 14, I think it's kind of gone. But to me, turnovers, man, like that is the equalizer. You Not only does Florida need a couple extra drives, but if you give Georgia an extra drive or two, you just don't have a chance. For you, what are what are some of the other keys to this game? You know, I think they have to take some shots. You know, I think where you see a game like Kentucky, and I don't know the play calls. I don't, you know, I haven't sat there and watched game film on what Kentucky was running, but you just didn't really see them take shots downfield. You saw a lot of dink and dunks, you know, screen mm -hmm. kind of plays, wheel routes, you know, those just like dink and dunk type of plays. And I think Florida, or excuse me, Georgia is too good in their front seven. I think – you know, Florida obviously is coming in with a good rushing attack, but it's going to be hard to consistently do that against a front seven like Georgia's. Their secondary, 
they're good. You know, they've had some injuries back there. So I think that, you know, if, if you had to pick a weakness on a really good Georgia defense where there's not a lot of weaknesses to pick, I think you got to take those shots downfield like an Anthony Richardson did against LSU, stretching the field, taking some shots. You look at Florida against Alabama this last year in the SEC championship game, another really good defense that Alabama played. Florida had success stretching the ball down the field, taking yeah. some shots. So I think that that's what Florida's going to have to do in this game against Georgia. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. Then I, I mean, Anthony Richardson has to kind of go hero mode because I don't think this old line – for Florida is going to give the quarterbacks a whole lot of time if you're trying to go deep, right? So I think some of that's going to, I mean, you're going to have to win busted plays against Georgia. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. I think that front seven, as good as they are, as banged up as Florida is on the O-line, I mean, we've seen it. The, you know, the quarterbacks haven't looked nearly as comfortable in the pocket in the last right, two, three games. Just, I mean, the O-line's banged up. I, I, think, I think you're right. I think that, you know, Downfield shots are going to be a part of it. You're going to have to connect on some explosive plays. But I also think, you know, Anthony Richardson's going to have to make plays on third and eight, third and nine, third and ten. I mean, you're going to get those. Like, you're going to have sure. those downs against Georgia because, like you said, they are so good in the front seven defensively. You're not going to get anything easy. I do think you'll have opportunities downfield. Like, I don't think Georgia's going to do what Kentucky did and just drop eight all game. I, I think Kentucky partially did that knowing, you know, the talent, you know, was was – in Florida's favor there, you know, and so they, they kind of were the underdog had to kind of, you know, control the flow of the game that way. And I think they did it by, you know, forcing Florida to execute in the red zone. I think Georgia probably comes into this game thinking, Hey, we're good enough. They've got a quarterback. That's a little bit inexperienced in Anthony Richardson. If they go to Emory Jones, he's a guy that eh, we don't really see anything on tape that we're overly concerned about. He tends to turn it over. I think if you're Georgia, you just line up and play. And typically, that's what you can do when you're the more talented team. I mean, that's that's what George has done all year to teams. So, I, I, I you know, I, there's part of me, Blake, that, again, I, I go back to what I said in the first part of the show is like, Dan Mullen is a really good offensive coach, man. He's going to draw something up that's going to hit in this game. The question, I think, is how long it hits for. And when we were talking on the, the SEC teleconference to Kirby Smart, he kind of said that. He said, hey, when you play Dan Mullen, man, it's really hard because you're getting ready for an encyclopedia of offense, right? Like Dan Mullen and his staff have been together so long that they have answers to every different thing you're going to do. And defensively, what you have to do is try to stay ahead and and be able to adapt to his plan quickly, right? Like if Dan Mullen draws something up, he's hitting on some concept in the passing game that you can't cover. The wheel route last year, for example. It's about how quickly you adjust. And I think Florida's probably not going to be able to get more than 10, 14 points off that quote unquote surprise, right? And that's where I go back to the off schedule plays, creating extra drives. Um, George is going to adjust well, man. They're, they're too good defensively not to. And so this is a game where you can't make mistakes. And as much as I'd love to sit here and say, you know, I really think Dan Mullen's probably been working on stuff that we haven't seen all season that's going to show up in this Georgia game. Two back sets, uh, you know, some of the other things with multiple quarterbacks even on the field at the same time. There's going to be stuff that Florida can take advantage of, but it's got to be hit on almost at 100% rate. And if you don't, Georgia's going to take advantage. I, I just think, to me, Blake, I, I tend to be more deferential to Mullen's ability to scheme up in big games like this. I don't have a high degree of optimism that this game doesn't turn into a real blowout. I just don't. I mean, that's where I'm at right now. I think... I just think motivation is going to be hard. I mean, you can talk all you want about upsetting Georgia and 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 not and derailing their undefeated season, but at the end of the day, man, Zach Carter said day one he came back to come back win a title. Help Florida kind of finish the right way. That's off the table. I, I just don't see it, man. I'll be honest with you. I know that sounds very bleak for the fans listening on the podcast, but I don't. I don't. I don't see any way that this game goes Florida's way. So you would take the lines 14. Would you take the over for I'm, that? I'm or? taking Georgia. And the, and the easiest reason for that, Florida turns the ball over, man. Florida turns the ball over way too much. Uh, both quarterbacks threw two interceptions in the LSU game. Georgia's defense is better than LSU's, man. And uh, Florida doesn't get many takeaways. I mean, they've done a little bit better getting some balls in the secondary in the last couple of weeks. But, I mean, they just they don't do enough there. And I, I just see... You know, there's Georgia has too many answers. Florida doesn't have enough. Florida has so many question marks. I don't see it. So I, I'm taking Georgia to cover. Uh, I think this one's going to get ugly. And, um, you know, Blake, we'll, we'll see if that happens where it leaves us. But I do think Florida's getting very close to the point of no return. And I think I think that point of no return kind of tends to show up in recruiting. You know, I go back to Will Muschamp's tenure at Florida. You know, they recruited 
well numbers wise after that 2013 season but you started seeing the difference makers the the true top level guys start to disappear you know when florida had that four win season lost to georgia southern and i think the way florida's class is already trending i think if you don't get a very very positive narrative result and that that means that there's some way that you come out of this as a florida fan or a florida coach florida player saying hey we're still in this thing. We had a rough year. We've had some bad bounces this year. But look, look at what we did against Georgia. We're not that far away. Yes, there's things we can improve. I think unless you come away being able to say that, you're in real trouble. That's that's the way I view it. So. Yeah, I agree with you. All right, Blake. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode of the podcast. We'll be back on Sunday breaking down the Florida-Georgia game. I'm sure there will be plenty to talk about one way or another. We appreciate you guys tuning in. I wish I had a more optimistic view for the Florida fans listening to this podcast, but unfortunately, I mean, you guys see it. Georgia's a really, really good football team. All you have to do is look at the recruiting rankings to know that, and unfortunately, this is a year where it seems to be panning out for for Georgia on the field. I mean, defensively, they're incredible, and and offensively, they, they seem to have it clicking pretty well right now. So we'll see how the game plays out, guys, but that's going to do it for today's episode of the Swamp 24-7 Podcast. We appreciate you tuning in. 